Hello everyone, um, nice to meet all of you. And first of all, let me thank Petra for inviting me to share my humble experiences from Singapore at this conference. And I really look forward to learning from all of you at this conference as well. I am an art teacher educator at the National Institute of Education in Singapore. And it is the only teacher training institution in the country. NIU works very closely with the Ministry of Education and other government agencies, and therefore I am actively involved in arts policies work, as well as national arts services with colleagues from these various organizations. So in today's short presentation, I would like to share the status of art education in Singapore in areas where I believe we have done well, as well as um, practices that I think need to be reconsidered to make art genuinely meaningful for children and young adolescents in school. Earlier in June this year, in the midst and peak of the pandemic, during a six-week lockdown in Singapore, a poll was conducted by the Straits Times, the national newspaper. About 1,000 participants participated in this survey, and they're all above the age of 16. So, would you like to guess which job will survey as the most essential and what jobs are considered as the most non-essential in this national survey? So unfortunately, as you can see from this slide, artist is considered as the most non-essential in this survey. The article generated public outcry in the days that followed, especially from local artists and art groups. While others may question the intention of the national paper for conducting the poll and criticize the many flaws that such surveys have, the survey did somewhat signal the state of art education in Singapore that we, as art educators, cannot ignore. One of the questions that lingers in my head is that if the pandemic is over, or if the poll was carried out under normal circumstances, would the results be very much different? I asked the same question to my students who are training to be art teachers. And we guess that the answer is probably a no, that the artists will still very much be considered as non-essential, whether pre or post pandemic. Of course, we can debate what non-essential really means and how is art defined in the poll. But to disregard the poll results and think that all is fine with art education in schools, at least in Singapore, is also foolish. Although this poll was carried out in Singapore, it raises some fundamental questions about the nature of art learning and the role of art education. The experiences shared in this presentation, I hope, can be extrapolated to other contexts as well. Singapore is, is a small nation with a population of 5.7 million, and it is slightly of a size smaller than New York City. And like New York City, Singapore is a cosmopolitan city-state consisting of citizens from different ethnic groups. Singapore government adopts very pragmatic and deliberate policies and has successfully built its human capital over the last 50 years, making Singapore one of the richest and most competitive economies in the world. Education, like elsewhere in the world, plays a critical role in the country's achievements. Art, being a mandatory subject in primary and lower secondary schools, fulfilled different roles during the different times of the nation's short history. For example, in the early years of nation building, art was important in fostering national identity. The role of art in creating national consciousness among its citizens remains, but art continued to be charged with more and newer responsibility in recent times. In the last 20 years, globalization and rapid technological advancement have brought about a new economy 
that values creativity, knowledge generation, and diversity. Singapore's government understands the cultural and economic potentials of the arts. It aims to transform the country into a knowledge economy that is well supported by a dynamic arts and cultural environment. It also wants to leverage on art education to cultivate creativity, imagination, and innovation for the new economy and the new world order. As one can observe, art education is tasked with meeting the demands of the government's new ideologies. The commitment and determination to do so can be seen in some examples in key policies enacted in the last two decades. The Renaissance City Report, initiated in 2000, set up plans to expand and develop Singapore arts and cultural landscape. Between 2012 to 2016, the Arts and Culture Strategic Review brought about an injection of 300 million Singapore dollar into the culture sector. The National Art Gallery Singapore was opened in November 2015 with an open cost of 532 million. It also holds the world's largest public collection of Singaporean and Southeast Asian art with over 8,000 artworks. On the education front, groundbreaking developments included the opening of the School of the Arts in 2008. It is a national school that offers international baccalaureate for students aged between 13 and 18 years old. A year later, in 2009, the School of Arts, Design and Media at Nanyang Technological University became the first and only public university that confers a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. In Singapore, we are very fortunate that art education is mandatory for all primary and secondary schools till secondary two. That means at least an hour of art lesson weekly from the age of seven to 14 year old, which is a good eight years of art education. We protected time for art lessons and ambitious national syllabus aims. The problem of generalist teaching art has to be addressed in primary school. In 2009, the Ministry published a report by the Primary Education Review and Implementation Committee. In the report, it was recommended that specialist teachers for art, music, physical education were needed in primary schools. The committee was convinced that the learning of skills and values through these subjects hinged on teachers' use of engaging pedagogy, and this demanded teachers to be specialists with training in the respective subjects. With so much support from the government in the arts and cultural sector and affirmative policies to support art teacher specialization, it is all the more imperative to consider what can we do differently in schools to help our students appreciate the meaning of art and help young people experience the essential value of art in their lives. If one were to look at schools and classrooms, barely much has changed. Teachers are still regarded as the authority in subject matter knowledge, despite the many easily available online resources on YouTube and other platforms that provide skills and knowledge. Many of these free online resources are sometimes more engaging for students because they allow for customization based on their learning needs. Curriculum in schools continue to be highly controlled by state authorities and students' learning are measured by exams against predetermined standards. And the standards regarded as knowledge and skills desired by the workforce. The current education model has served Singapore well so far, although the current pandemic has also revealed some weaknesses in the system. Even so, it is difficult to bring about broad changes these well-established social institution without upsetting some stakeholders' fixed mindsets and interests. On top of the above mentioned conservative practices, I observed that art education in Singapore, 
especially in the area of teaching, face additional challenges. Firstly, recent general political valuing of art has brought about many positive developments in local schools, but it is also an irony that art teachers face unprecedented challenge of having to meet increased demands from various stakeholders. The newly established benefits of art has been translated as additional expectations to be fulfilled through education. Connections, dispositions, and values that are often associated with art are now spelled out as learning outcomes to be achieved at various levels of schooling. It is without doubt that many benefits of art engagement and connection have been supported in neuroscience and brain research. Books by renowned scholars such as Rudolf Anheim, Harvard Gardner, and Elliot Eisner are just some that we are all familiar with. Unfortunately, what happens here is that art becomes an instrument in developing these cognitive traits in school. Art teachers are consumed with how they should design lessons and set assessments that could best cultivate these cognitive skills and abilities and lose the most important plot in the story of art education, which is the young individual who is making the art. The second challenge to an authentic and personal artistic experience is that too much information in the form of formal knowledge is forced upon young children and adolescents. Younger children are concerned with expressing their ideas about the world and making sense of the world that they see through visuals. Older students are attempting to make sense of their own identity while seeking resolutions to the many conflicting emotions that they are experiencing as they enter adolescence. It is important to help children and young adults widen their perspectives about art, in which it is part of the larger visual culture that students exist in. And I agree that learning about what other artists are doing will enrich students' perspectives and their own making. However, the delivery of information on artists, artworks, techniques should be rooted in and centered around these young people's experiences, ideas, and interests. Art learning for children and young adults in schools are often contrived where there is a lack of genuine space in art projects for personal voice to be heard. Introduction of art movements and artists with selection of their works are presented to students as unchallenged truths and facts to be learned. And the tasks that follow are frequently to mimic the styles or techniques taught, with superficial choices given to students to fit their own voice to a predetermined output. These above description of lessons is a rather common sight in Singapore classrooms and perhaps in the many classrooms around the world too. And finally, the last challenge may be rather unique to Singapore's context. MOE, or the Ministry, has striven to bring about a more balanced art curriculum that emphasizes both art making and art appreciation. In its latest national syllabuses, it has listed artworks that are mandatory to be introduced to students with the belief that art appreciation will complement art making. One of the main reasons that the ministry has adopted such a structured approach to bring across the message of the importance of a balanced curriculum is that for the longest time, art education in Singapore has suffered from factory-like, product-driven approaches to art teaching. This is especially the case in primary schools. In secondary schools, art teachers put heavy emphasis on techniques and polished works so that students could test well later at national exams. Such narrow focuses on technique mastery and end products have prompted the ministry to be deliberate in forcing art teachers to pay attention to art appreciation. And this has led to the creation of a list of recommended artworks grouped according to themes to be taught to students in both primary and secondary schools. While I extol the ministry's effort to push for a more comprehensive art education, the set list of artists has not resolved superficial, if not inaccurate, teaching of art in areas 
such as art movements, artists, and artworks. As I have said earlier, there is certainly a need for students to be acquainted with the world of artists and the many roles of art. However, these should pivot around students and their making, around art making that is carefully designed to encourage and stimulate multiple perspectives and voices. Having to teach artists and artworks to students simply because they are mandatory in the syllabus make it a real challenge for art teachers to design meaningful lessons that inspire authentic art making. Art teachers set off wanting to teach art instead of designing lessons to assist young persons under their charge to develop their sense of self through art making. With the set list of artworks to be covered, art techniques to be taught, and the many other learning outcomes to be achieved, art teachers' attention is diverted from the very target that they should be aiming at, which is the young students. Schools, curriculum, teachers, students, and technology will remain in the system, but each of these are likely to be transformed by technological demands. Teaching, as how we know it now, will continue to morph. The idea that teachers are the subject expert in class is no longer fully legitimate when knowledge are easily and freely accessible online in most societies. The role of the teachers as facilitators, learning designers, and mentors who are able to skillfully situate issues and themes in context to enable students' learning will be more relevant and constructive. Like many parents and adults here, I have seen how natural it is for young children to draw and make art. It is an almost a daily natural event that occupies the child for long periods of time and brings much pride and pleasure. The many first-hand observation of seeing my own six-year-old daughter create in a natural setting is a luxury, away from the tiresome protocols of research ethics and procedures, away from theories about learning that sometimes seem remote. And just last week, my six-year-old daughter came home with some branches and dry leaves and said that she wanted to see how the dry leaf would change in color over the next few days. She continued to tell me excitedly and seriously that she was going to make a tree with the dry branches and dry leaves, explaining how each item represented parts of a tree. So as you can see from the slide, this is a little installation work for my daughter. It was rather amazing that she was a land artist suddenly, and I was humbly reminded that the many ideas that children have, how it was innate for them to respond to the world that they see, to make sense of what they see through the arrangement of visuals, whether be it through drawing, painting and constructing, and that such desires are powerful. Making art addresses the affective and cognitive domains of a person. In INSEA World Congress held in Vancouver last year, the theme making has reunited one of the central features of art. Many colleagues have shared the relationships between engagement in art and the, and the many benefits art provides. The act of making and creating is something that is innate in us. This is very evident in young children. Theories about the importance of making, of creating, of expressing can be found in works by prominent scholars such as John Dewey, Victor Lowenfeld, and Herbert Reed. As mentioned earlier, research studies and scholars have written volumes about art and cognition. But we somehow still get it wrong in school. We create many fancy materials resources, prescribed thinking routines that we believe should aid in art learning, but we miss and underestimate the most important element in art education, which is the making itself. In his book, Why We Make Art and Why We Teach It, my mentor and good friend, Professor Richard Hickman from Cambridge, described how making is native in all of us. He defines making as opportunities for anyone to create something of aesthetic significance and something which has meaning for the person who created it. This definition 
captures succinctly humans' natural instinctive desire to create and make. For children and young adults, art provides the critical platform for them to represent and negotiate lived experiences. When these young people are encouraged to make art, with them as the center of focus, and with the aim of enabling them to be confident creators, cognition, and habits that are deemed so valuable by policymakers will naturally be nurtured and expanded through the process. But when the focus is fixated on desired end results and the young adults fade into the background, if art lessons are designed on the onset with the aim for students to complete some task for the sake of meeting learning outcomes, we lose the chance to preserve the very natural instinct to make and create meaning in young people. Studio art courses continue to be very popular at my university and many undergraduates from non-art faculties and schools within the university choose studio classes as their general electives. And during this semester, while most classes are affected by safe distancing measures and many art lessons have to be conducted online, we still see a strong number of undergraduates who have chosen studio classes as their electives. These may further affirm Pigman's proposition that most of us have the desire to create and make when opportunities present themselves. Artists who teach in these classes are leveraging on technology available to continue to provide these opportunities. While this technology-mediated learning is not perfect, and the artists are concerned with the quality of online art lessons, and it doesn't afford social interaction with the students, most believe that the chance for students to make outweighs the mediated mode of delivery at this time. So in this video that I'm going to show you, it is conducted via Google Classroom.
So as you can see from this short little snippet of um, an example of how we are trying our very best to use technology to mediate the, as, a, as a mediation tool for studio classes. And um, although it is not perfect, and I'm sure a lot of you are probably also doing something similar, if not better, and more creative than what you are seeing here. But I think the most important um, message that we get here is that students want to create and students want to learn. They want to have the, they want the opportunities to learn to make art. And these undergraduates, okay, they can choose whatever studio classes that they feel will address their learning needs. And I think it is important that such a platform continues to be present within their means to create. So finally, before I leave or I end the presentation, I would like to share this slide. Um, I would like to share this quote taken from the book, The Art Spirit, by renowned American painter and uh, educator, Robert Henri. Let me just read for you. I do not want to see how skillful you are. I am not interested in your skill. What do you get out of nature? Why do you paint this subject? What is life to you? What reasons and what principles have you found? What are your deductions? What projections have you made? What excitement, what pleasure do you get out of it? Your skill is the thing of least interest to me. I believe that as art educators, especially those of us who work with children and adolescents in schools, we need to create the space for them to make and for us to ask these questions about their making. If only we get our focus right, I believe the poll results that was published in June in Singapore might see a better chance of artists being seen as essential. And with this, I thank you and wish you a fruitful time at this conference. And this is my email if you would like to continue the conversation with me. And with that, thank you very much and have a wonderful time at the conference.